welcome to everyone who's here tonight. Uh, I'm Patrice Kelch, uh, obviously not Shelley Graff. Shelley is very much taller. Um, and uh, I'm a longtime member of Common Ground since 1994, so I've been here as a practitioner, as a, a teacher. Um, a good part of my practice for the past two decades has been practicing with people who are incarcerated, which has really um, deepened my practice in <coughs> all kinds of ways. And I'm also, uh, in addition to my activities with Common Ground, I'm on the board of the Minnesota Multi-Faith Network. And I'm also a citizen activist with Isaiah and Faith in Minnesota. And that actually inspires the topic of my talk tonight, which is about um, dismantling, dismantling polarization within myself, which is an ongoing spiritual practice. Um, I want to begin um, acknowledging that common ground is cited on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary homeland of the Dakota and Ojibwe people. This land holds great historical, spiritual, and personal significance to its original inhabitants and their descendants who live here today and to their future generations. We acknowledge the sovereignty of Native nations and our obligations to live up to our treaty agreements. It is our intention to rectify the harms that we have committed and those that we continue to commit. This land acknowledgement is only one small part of supporting Indigenous communities. It is our hope that our land acknowledgement statement will inspire others to stand with Native nations and to amplify the voices of Indigenous people leading grassroots change movements. So what we'll do now is sit for about half an hour. I'll do a little gentle guiding at the beginning and um, then do a little stretch and then have time for me to offer some remarks and maybe have uh, some discussion. So I am about to ring the bell and I hope it moves up closer to move this up here for now so that everybody gets to hear the invitation of the bell. As the sound of the bell fades, just let your attention for a minute be with an appreciation of the support that we give to and get from each other when we come together like this. And appreciate that everyone who's here, either virtually or in person was able to follow through on an intention to practice this evening. So just really appreciating that as we start, because so often <coughs> we have really good intentions and life just sort of gets in the way and we're not able to follow through. So just take a moment to appreciate that you're here that we're here to support each other. We're here to be liberated together. <clears throat> and you might, as we begin our formal practice tonight, take a moment just to clarify your own intention for this time.
sometimes practice is an opportunity to really explore what it means to be kind to ourselves, to benefit ourselves. Or we might be sitting with the idea of benefiting all beings. So it's helpful to have some sense of your intention. And with that, I would invite you to let go of any fixed idea you might have about what a good meditation is, what a good meditator does. Invite your whole self into the room. All those parts, not just the not just the good meditator, but really invite your whole self into your practice. Mindfulness is being present to what is actually present in the present moment's experience. So in mindfulness, we are open to what arises, what passes away, whether it's bodily sensations, emotions, thoughts. You can see if it's possible just to have a very receptive awareness You might want to use the breath to stabilize yourself. But that's not necessary. What is it like to be here right now with this mind, this body, this present moment? Can we open to the present moment's experience, however it is, with an undercurrent of kindness? It's not uncommon for people to meditate with a really harsh, critical voice, criticizing themselves all the time about not doing it right. So as best we can, we let go of harming ourselves by entertaining that voice or believing that voice. It's helpful to come back to the goodness of our intention, whatever that is. Let ourselves be receptive, kind, curious in our meditation.
completely accepting this mind and this body right here and right now.
And for the last few minutes of our formal meditation, you might just see if in the present moment there is some sense of gratitude, some sense of appreciation, maybe like a very faint fragrance. Just open to the possibility of there being somewhere in this present moment some sense of gratitude or appreciation. Not something you have to fabricate, but something you might notice. So if you're on um, Zoom, you should cast your gaze somewhere else for at least 20 seconds and give your, give your eyes a little, a little rest from staring at the screen. And if you're here in the room, you might want to stretch a little bit, stand up, stretch. It's great. All I can see on one of the cells is a wagging tail, which is just just makes me so happy. It's, it's sort of not really a zoom unless a kid or a cat or a dog kind of comes in and enters. <clears throat> but it's great to see. It's actually a, is that a lamb? There's a little lamb. Someone has a little baby lamb on here. So that's that's very sweet. So Shelley usually reads from uh, Sharon Salzberg, but tonight I'm going to read a little bit from someone else. And that person is Pema Chodron, who is a wonderful Buddhist teacher in the Tibetan tradition, and she is the abbess of a monastery in Nova Scotia, and just has such 
and accessible, straightforward way of talking about what goes on in our, our lives. And is just a, a wonderful person. And this is something that uh, I've actually been practicing with um, all fall, reading this book, Welcoming the Unwelcome. And the theme that she has in this book, one of the main themes, is about um, dismantling the polarization in our own hearts and our own minds. And so I'll read um, a little bit. She says, there are many ways to talk about the problems of this world, but one way or another, all of them have to do with polarization. We have a tendency to divide people, things, and ideas into sharply contrasting categories. Consciously or unconsciously, we carry around concepts of us and them, right and wrong, worthy and unworthy. In this framework, there's not much room for a middle ground. Everything is at one pole or another. When groups of people or whole nations get together around these concepts, they can become hugely magnified, which may result in large-scale suffering, discrimination, oppression, and war. These national and global problems have their roots in the subtle workings of our own individual minds. All of us, to our own degree, experience some feeling of opposition inside ourselves with each other and with the world around us. We're never quite satisfied with ourselves as we are, other people as they are. Often we feel this as an aversion to whatever we're experiencing. We don't like what's happening and we want to get rid of it. This can start out as a subtle level of aversion which can grow into more obvious irritation. From there it may escalate to full-blown anger and hatred. And she says, Polarization is most problematic when we dehumanize people, when we forget that the people we judge, criticize, and disagree with are actually as fully human as we are. This dehumanization can manifest in an obvious way, such as apartheid, slavery, police brutality, or genocide. But some level of this kind of prejudice exists in all our minds. If we're honest with ourselves, we see that we habitually dehumanize others for many reasons. For example, if people have political views that we consider narrow-minded or backward, we may have trouble seeing them as wholly human. If they don't believe in climate change or evolution, we may unconsciously disqualify them as fully developed members of the human race. If we commit to being aware of our tendency to polarize, and we counteract that by arousing, the word she uses here is bodhicitta, which is, means the awakened heart in Tibetan. It's very much like the metta that we talk about in, in this tradition. If we counteract that by arousing the awakened heart, we will gradually close these gaps. Then we'll be able to see all people as fellow human beings that want to be happy, just like us. There's a practice I call just like me. You go to a public place, sit there, and look around. Traffic jams are very good, <coughs> very good for this. You zero in on one person and say to yourself things like, just like me, this person doesn't want to feel uncomfortable. Just like me, this person loses it sometimes. Just like me, this person doesn't want to be disliked. Just like me, this person wants to have friends and intimacy. If we view others from the standpoint of just like me, we have a strong basis to connect with them, even in situations where it seems most natural and reasonable to polarize. Even when extreme religious groups behead people or a racist gunman murders people praying in church, there is room to feel our connection with the perpetrators rather than to humanize them. The mother of James Foley, one of the journalists beheaded by ISIS, said of her son's executioner, we need to forgive him for not having a clue to what he was doing. This level of compassion can only happen when people have a sense of the complexity of what makes people reach to the point of committing such crimes. Those who believe in violence are desperate to get some kind of ground under their feet, desperate to get away from their unpleasant feelings, desperate to be the one who's right. What would we do if we felt so desperate? 
what she says, having compassion for those who have harmed us, and especially those who have taken away our loved ones, doesn't come easily. We shouldn't feel that there's something wrong with us if we don't at present feel this degree of understanding and caring. In fact, it's quite exceptional to feel this way. As a precursor to this level of empathy, sorrow, simple sorrow, is more often accessible. For instance, in the case of the violence committed by extreme militants, we can tap into deep sorrow for the situation as a whole. Along with our sorrow for the victims, we can feel sorrow for the young men that find themselves hating so much, sorrow that they're stuck in such a pattern of hatred. Since things have such complex and far-reaching causes, we can feel sorrow for the circumstances where ignorance or suffering in the past created the hatred that is manifesting now. We can harness all this all-encompassing sorrow to arouse the broken-hearted feeling that fosters bodhicitta. Having compassion doesn't mean that we can't take a stand. It's important to speak up when we've been hurt, when we see others being hurt, and when we observe or experience examples of abuse of power. It's equally important to listen deeply and without judgment when people speak about their experiences and their suffering. So this has been a really useful and uh, important practice for me. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm uh, someone who is really engaged in um, activist politics. And a lot of my practice over the past couple of years has really been in not demonizing my opponents. And, um, and that's really been um, trying to take refuge in loving kindness and equanimity, recognizing that my opponents, people who don't hold my views, are persons just like myself, subject to the same poisons of greed, hatred, and delusion, that just like me, they're subject to the eight worldly winds of pleasure and pain, loss and gain, praise and blame, and fame and shame. And noticing my own tendency to separate, to discount, just really trying to be really vigilant about seeing, um, seeing when I am othering. And um, today I was at the Capitol uh, listening to a couple of hearings of bills both in the Senate and in, um, in the House. And um, persons I was with whom I really care about just said, you know, of the, the opposition, I can't believe how stupid they are. And I just, it's, um, I'm really trying not to do that. When I disagree with people are holding views that are diametrically opposed to my own, I am really trying to figure out why they why they hold those views and not simply assume that they're they're ignorant. Um, and it's been really useful for me to work with the five um, Buddhist trainings on not harming the precepts which are you know, refraining from intentional injury, refraining from taking anything that's not freely given, refraining from misusing <coughs> sexuality, refraining from false or injurious speech, and finally refraining from consuming entities that cloud the mind and lead to carelessness. And um, what I did, uh, a couple of years ago when I was working very hard um, on um, for uh, an electoral issue that ultimately did not come to fruition. Um, it was very polarized, very, um, very contentious. And what I really did was try to recast the precepts in a way that I would always have as my ultimate intention somehow uh, 
having the possibility of reconciling with my opponents, of not being on opposite sides. And in fact, this was, it was very painful because people that I know, people have been to my house, disagreed with me enormously over this, this issue and said unkind things on Facebook. And um, it, was, it was just very, very painful. And I just kept thinking about, no, I don't want to have these people who were my, my friends who I've known for a long time to be, you know, for this to be divisive. So how do I work with the intention, with the precepts of, of really um, examining my own motivation, my own understanding? And um, so this is what I came up with in applying the precepts to avoid falling into this sort of us-them dualism, this polarization, and to allow for a possibility of um, reconciliation. Of coming together. And the first was uh, to begin with the intention of not harming myself or others, even as I clearly engage with hurt and trauma. And to realize how frequently in all sorts of, of divisiveness, from individuals to nations, um, it's disrespect and humiliation or a sense of violation or a sense of loss is really the seed. So to get beyond sort of you have this position, I have this position, to really understand. Um, and, and as I look at conflicts that go on sometimes for, for decades, there is often at, at the heart of it a sense that the two parties, each one believes that the other is disrespected, that they're humiliated. And you know, humiliation may be one of the most painful emotions that we can, can have. Uh, you know, to humiliate, to disrespect someone is to uh, just cause tremendous harm. And so one of the things of working with this first precept um, and it is to, to really make sure that I am not disrespecting or humiliating or mocking um, the persons that I, I don't disagree with. And I, I will say with people I worked with, um, there were some... Um, ads that were meant to be funny, and I thought they were just disrespectful. Um, you know, that, that it's, um, and so it's very hard to sort of stay in coalition too with people, you know, I want to stay um, connected to the people who also share my views. And sometimes we disagree over things like you know, what is, um, what is appropriate, like making fun of, um, of the opponent's position in, in a way. Uh, being sarcasm. You know, sarcasm is uh, one of those um, knives that, that just causes a lot of, a lot of bleeding. So that's, that's one thing, be aware of harm. And to realize that often in, in many issues, there are long histories on both sides of, of trauma and, and anger. Um, the second was to resolve not to take anything that is not my own, so what am I not, including projections I might think another person holds. And not to take things personally, uh, not to take up a lot of self-righteous chatter and it's, it's often the case that we believe the opposition hates us and wants to destroy us. And I've been listening to and, and doing some research and, and trying to understand what's called high conflict. And one of the things that researchers say is that people believe that the opposition 
hates them, wants to destroy them. And, and what I was listening to actually talked about Democrats and Republicans and was saying that a vast number of, of Democrats believe that Republicans just hate them and want harm for them. And a vast majority of Republicans believe that Democrats just hate them and want to, do, um, want to destroy them. When actually, people disagree, but most people don't hate and want to destroy other persons. What happens is that the extremists, no matter of, of any position, are assumed to represent the majority. It's a mistake that we make over and over and over again, that we assume that, that the most extreme position stands for everyone who's sort of in that, that camp or that side. And so not to, this idea about sort of not taking anything that's not my own, is not to buy into that, not to buy into that the most extreme, um, extreme sentiments extreme, expresses what the majority feels. But it's really easy to fall into, um, into that trap. So there can be disagreement without disparagement. And that it's often really useful to assume that other people have uh, reasons for what they, they believe that, um, you know, to, to sort of not assume the worst intentions of everyone and not to take that on. And not also not to take on that when I'm talking with my opponent that they just think the worst about me. So let go of that. I don't know. I don't know what they think. The third is is I take responsibility for monitoring and working with my own energies and not letting them undermine or overpower my engagement with others. And this is where mindfulness practice really, really, really comes in. That mindfulness is, mindfulness of the body especially, is so salient here, somatic awareness, that when there is um, engagement, when there's a direct action of, of some sort, it's really important to stay grounded in the body and notice what's going on in the body. And if I can stay present with the discomfort in my body when something is going on, I am much less likely to lash out from a place of reactivity. If I can be with the body, be with the um, sort of the roiling emotion, whatever is going on, if I can really stay that this and be with the body and notice the discomfort here, I'm much less likely to displace it and kind of just lash out. At, at others. Um, the idea of pausing, of grounding, of always coming back over and over again about this intention to act in alignment with my deepest values. And that's really a, a wonderful practice and um, just so, so useful. I practice deep, the fourth is I practice deep listening even as I speak my truth, acknowledging the limits of my own understanding. Um, nonviolent communication is a great support in doing this training in nonviolent communication because you're listening for what another person needs. And sometimes that's the need to be respected, the need to be heard. Um, and. Um, the need to feel safe. So, you know, when we can, can talk with another person and they can know that um, our intention is to be harmless. We have no intention of harming them. You, know, you, you can feel safe around people who are not interested in, in harming you. Um, so that seems, um, you know, uh, two things. Um, one is today when I was at the hearing, both in the Senate and in the uh, House uh, committee hearings, every time um, 
there's someone sort of presenting a bill and then was being questioned by other, by the senators who are on the committee or the House people. The person who was, um, had a question would have to raise their hand and uh, the chair would say, you know, Miss so-and-so, um, you may ask a question. That person always had to say, thank you, Madam Chair, thank you, Senator or Representative, whoever was presenting the bill. Um, and uh, when the person was answering whatever this question was, which was sometimes a little barbed, that person would have to say, thank you, Madam Chair, thank you, Senator Th uh, Smith, for that question. I mean, every single time, both in the House and in the Senate, before they could answer, before they could ask the question, they would have to thank the chair and thank the other person. And I thought, this is great. I mean, it takes up a lot of time, and it, it is kind of a dance back and forth. But I thought, this is so, there is a pause. It's, it just frames things in kind of a courteous, um, uh, buffers it with courtesy. You thank the chair, you thank the person who has asked you the question, you thank them for the question, and then you respond. And um, you know, when they say, oh, thank you for presenting this bill, this is my question. Uh, but I, I just thought, boy, this would be great if we could sort of make this a practice in a lot of other places that you had to thank someone for, uh, recognize them, thank them for asking the question, thank them for answering the question, um, and it just seemed to be that that sort of civility was really, really important. Another uh, sort of uh, practice that I've, I've used, um, I have done in the past couple of years a lot of phone banking, which I will tell you, it's not my favorite thing to do. I, mean, I go into it with, you know, this is sort of my, my obligation. And if there are, I get to talk to 10 people out of the 100 I've called, that would be great. And if there are three or four of them that I can convince to go out and vote or something else, that's wonderful. Because, you know, in our elections, we have such narrow, narrow, narrow percentages. You know, I think it was a, a a couple of years ago that in uh, it was one of the Brooklyn's, the mayoral uh, election was done by, it was I think two votes ultimately. And a couple of years ago, our city council, it ended up being five votes. So I think, okay, this is a worthwhile thing to do. But you know, uh, usually I get an answering machine, but sometimes I get, um, um, I always try to thank you, thank you for, thank you for picking up the phone. But I've gotten yelled at at the phone. People just slam down the phone, people are rude. and. What I've done, to not take it personally, is I do a little meta in between, you know, while it's dialing up. I think, you know, Susan Jones, may you be safe, may you be happy. You know, like, my mind is in a good place, and even if this person slams down the phone, I say, you know, I, I do. Susan Jones, I want you to be happy. So, you know, that, that sort of, um, with our, our speech, our intention to engage in a friendly way, seems to me to be really important in this effort not to polarize. Um, and finally, the, the fifth, which is, I restrain myself from acting on any impulse that fosters carelessness in either or both senses of the word, being heedless or being heartless. And this is really the safeguard for all the precepts. It's about coming back to um, wisdom and compassion about really having this, this intention to be intentional, to pay attention. And you know, Ruth King, the wonderful teacher who wrote Mindfulness of, of Race, um, says, life is not personal, permanent, or perfect. It's clear seeing into the universality of our our human predicament. 
And it's this, um, you know, because we live in such polarized times and things are, um, you know, both nationally and internationally, there is um, so much um, angst, so much distrust, so much anger. And if we can, in our own hearts, depolarize ourselves, and a friend of mine who's, who's a therapist um, reminded me that sometimes the people we encounter are so hurt, so angry, so enraged that there's no room for anything else. Sometimes people are just in a place where you know, they can't see other people's children as children or they can't um, they are just so overwhelmed with hurt that they can't see anything but their own injustice and their own wounding. And my friend, the therapist, said, you know, when you're like that, when you're completely flooded by an emotion, when you encounter someone like that, all you can do is try to have a safe, loving space a space that keeps them from harming themselves or harming others. But that this is something where we just bring you know, tremendous compassion and patience and we hold that. We don't try to change that person's mind. We don't try to show that person that their views are incorrect, that they need to see things differently. When people are in tremendous emotional flooding and distress, the compassionate response is really to, to be there and to, um, you know, I always say in my own heart, a compassion practice. Um, you know, when I'm, I'm with someone who is so angry about something that it just doesn't make sense to talk right now. But to be a safe person. And that's really a wonderful aspiration to be a person that people feel safe around, um, that they know you're not going to harm them. And that's part of this non-polarization. When we're not polarized, we're not going to harm someone, at least intentionally. Um, so I'm going to finish with um, reading the very end of this chapter by Emma Chodron. Emma says, working with polarization and dehumanization won't put an immediate end to the ignorance, violence, and hatred that plague this world. But every time we catch ourselves polarizing with our thoughts, words, or actions, and every time we do something to close that gap, we're injecting a little bodhicitta, a little awakened heart, into our usual patterns. We're deepening our appreciation for our interconnectedness with all others. We're empowering healing rather than standing in its way. And because of this interconnectedness, when we change our own patterns, we help change the patterns of our culture as a whole. The results won't be immediately apparent. You probably won't notice any big changes in just a week or a year. But please don't give up too easily and think, this awakened heart doesn't work for me. I'm going to look for something where results are more immediate and tangible. Believe me when I say your patience will pay off. If you commit to overcoming polarization in your own mind, it's a life changer. And it will help the world as well. So again, the book is Welcoming the Unwelcome by Pema Chodron. So we have um, a little time here um, to hear responses, um, either in the, the room or uh, in the Zoom room. So would anyone like to comment or ask a question? And if you're on Zoom, could you raise your 
um, your little zoom hand. No one yet on Zoom. Is there someone here who'd like to respond to that, to the comments tonight? Do you want to sit here so that people on, if you wouldn't mind sitting here, so people on Zoom can. Oh, that was, uh, well, it's way weirder talking up here. Um, yeah, I, I appreciated the, the topic because this is something I've worked with a lot too um, in both uh, political activism and um, like community organizing and there is just such an invitation to like an invitation to hatred um, just baked into a lot of those processes and a lot of the like spaces that you interact with people um, especially if you're doing the kind of political work or community organizing work that's not just based on um, party politics, but is really based on like struggling people and building power among struggling people, like struggling people are a lot more volatile, generally. Um, and yeah, the, I've had a, a similar practice that I would not have been able to say as eloquently as you did, but um, yeah, of really trying to approach even the, the angry and the fearful uh, things that come my way with that real patience and the, the willingness to like see the humanity and like, I will take this on if this is what you need to express um, to a point. I gotta protect myself as well. And it doesn't always work, but I've been amazed in some of the spaces that I've gone into that have, where I've been met with that immediate anger, that brick wall, that like unwillingness to see my humanity, that if I was willing to like be patient with that for a little bit and make myself available and still like even in response to that anger, um, just be, be present with them and try to be that safe space the way that that would way more times than I expected it to um, kind of dismantle or, or diffuse that anger and allow us to actually connect with a lot more vulnerability than I expected to to have and some of those have been like the deepest most impactful conversations that I can still recall almost verbatim because there was just such an intensity to them um, so anyway, thank you oh thank you um, the other thing I wanted to say is that with uh, I feel like even though I've built that kind of practice in my day-to-day -day work I've still been struggling lately with the the state of our international politics and especially our nation's role in what's happening in Gaza and like feeling, even though I, I understand this on like an interpersonal one-to-one -one kind of basis, like I totally believe this and I feel like I can stay really mm -hmm. rooted there. I like, there's such a powerlessness and helplessness to just like a thing that I have no control over personally and yet I can just watch, I mean, there's only so many dead and starving children and screaming mothers that I can see on my, in my palm day to day, um, that I just like, there's so much more energy toward like, patience will not solve this. And like, even with that faith in that, like patience and equanimity, there's like a drive to take more action even when that action feels like the drive is toward violence or toward like anything that will just shift or push. And I'm curious if you have been feeling something similar, if you have, like how you're relating to those feelings if you're experiencing them. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I would say that um, what Pema says in here about feel the sorrow, that's what's accessible to us right now, to feel the sorrow and um, 
one of the things, if we can't um, feel that we are effective in, um, in things that are way out there, I mean, sort of responses, I'm speaking personally now, some responses have been to um, donate money to World Central Kitchen, which is getting some food into, into Gaza. Um, but also, I, I think, well, what can I work on here? If I can't be effective there, you know, we can write our, our Congress people. Um, I also, you know, this again is, is part of this assumption. I really believe that um, in, in very complicated situations that our um, Anthony Blinken and other people are doing the best they can. Um, in a very complicated, uh, very behind the scenes situation. That's probably an article of faith. I don't know. Um, I feel the sorrow, but I also think, in, you know, rather than just be obsessed with that, what I need to do is see how can I make things better for people in my community right now. So whether it's um, you know, some of the work on getting rid of the pollutants in the Phillips neighborhood, um, getting some of those industries out, um, whether it's working on seeing about electrification and decarbonization um, in the green zones. I mean, there are all sorts of things where, where I think about, you know, what can I do? Well, I can give some money to people who are trying to get food into Gaza. Um, I can work on my community, and I can feel the sorrow. I mean, I don't turn away, I don't turn the television off when I see that. I really let that sink in. Um, so that's that's been uh, my response. And I also think when I, I think about violence, or um, I, I think about what is the, the potential harm here too. So that for me has been. Um, a guardrail um, in my in my activism about what is the harm that certain kinds of, of direct action might have, and um, and admitting that I don't know. I mean, all of this. Uh, some of my friends feel really differently than I do, and I just being really humble about. I just don't know, but I'm really trying to act. In alignment with my core values, but that's a, a great, a great question, and I don't know if other people, um, anyone in the Zoom room, want to comment. <laughs> ah, okay. I can't see your name, so you'll have to, and I'm going to move this right here so that, okay. Where are you? There you are. I'm here. I just wanted to say thank you to you um, for your work and also reflection. And also um, I, I do resonate with the speaker and I was, before he asked a second question, I was gonna ask something about um, sort of managing the, the power or the passion of, of you know, righteous anger um, and I think you've answered it, but um, I just wanted to say that I took some notes just now. So I appreciate you saying, feel the sorrow, um, donate money to the faraway cause, and then take action locally. Um, I was curious about the last thing you said, which is to admit that you don't know if your um, direct action causes harm. And um, I suppose none of us know what any of our actions may cause, whether they're intentionally beneficial or not. But I wonder what you do with that. Um, what you do with that awareness? Does it stop you, or is it just something that you sort of keep keep in mind? Oh, thank you, thank you so much for that um, that reflection. Um, you know, I. I had been demonstrating since the Vietnam War when I had to show the National Guard my ID to get on campus at Ohio State. Uh, I went
went to the big Cambodia rally in DC in 70. Uh, I mean, I, and reading Ibram Kendi um, after the, the murder of George Floyd really set me back on my heels. Because Kendi said, an, an activist is um, not you know, just a person who goes to protests or writes letters. To the editor. An activist is a person who changes policy, which actually was why I got involved with Isaiah and Faith in Minnesota, because I thought those were the vehicles that change policy. So I had been, um, in terms of, of activism, uh, I was part of a really beautiful silent march across the Stone Arch Bridge in late December that was um, several hundred people showed up. It was um, a really cold night and the idea was no speeches, no signs, we just walked together. And there were a number of rabbis and a number of imams and we all just walked together over the bridge and there were kids with, you know, parents brought their kids in snowsuits and it was just a very solemn um, feeling the sorrow and that to me was something that was really truly non-harming. Um, when I think about disrupting meetings, um, which in my history is, as you know, I've done in, in the past, but I'm, I'm much more um, judicious about that now, of thinking of what is going to be um, effective and what's not. And I also just remember from a million women's marches um, how seductive righteous anger is, how, um, how truly um, energizing it is, um, but I think sometimes the aftertaste is not really clean. Um, and I don't know what this has to do with, with being older now, when I, I look back, uh, I don't regret doing that, but I, I really think about what would be, what is effective. And I think that march across the, um, the bridge was really a, something of um, bringing that sort of, of solidarity of people saying, we are very sad, we are heartbroken, we are heartbroken together. And I think relying on, in many faiths, our wisdom traditions are really important. And you know that this tradition, which is about um, non-harming, which is about acting with compassion, um, about not othering, and that's essential to our, our Buddhist practice. And, um, and we all make mistakes. And you know, what I always love about Shelley's teaching is Shelley tells us over and over again, we're all learners. Our job is to be a learner. And so that's, that's what I uh, attempt to do. Um, and I try to stay humble. I don't know if, if my choice is the right, the right choice. Um, I do the best I can with the, the values I hold in that moment, what seems skillful. But thank you for your question. Anything else before we close? I really appreciate everyone who was here tonight, and um, I will um, offer uh, the um, sharing the merit, and then Eric is going to speak for a minute. So, if there's any benefit to our practice, any merit, any blessing, we would happily, joyfully, gladly share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away, every bit of it. We would share any blessings, any goodness with our teachers, our parents, our families, our friends, our community. We would share 
any blessings with the people we like and also with those we don't like so much. We would share any goodness with the people we know and the millions upon millions of people that we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would share any blessings, any goodness with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the scaly, the slimy, and the finny. May all beings find a path to peace. May all beings be free from suffering. So thank you all, and Eric is going to say something. Common Ground operates on the concept of Donna, which means that all of our programs, everything we do here is freely given and freely received. Um, on nights like tonight, when we have a guest teacher, um, it's a little different than most nights. Um, any any uh, desire to give back to the center um, on a night like tonight, two thirds of that goes directly to the teacher, one third goes to the operation of the buildings. When we, on a normal night with Shelley, everything just goes in, in one big pot. But again, everything here at Common Ground is freely given, freely received, and any impulse to give back or to share or to volunteer or to, or to give praise is completely within you and from you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, and you actually mentioned um, nonviolent communication. Um, and uh, I help run a local group where we learn nonviolent communication together, which is a path of speaking from the heart and also speaking our truth. Tomorrow night, um, 6, we have dinner served. Um, and then 6.30, we start the event. It goes till 8.30. We'll be um, re, um, covering the first introduction in chapter one of Orrin J. Sofer's Say What You Mean which is a book about mindfulness and nonviolent communication. And Oren J. Sofer um, is in the insight meditation tradition that we follow here at Common Ground. Um, and it's all donation based. Um, and we have a local NBC expert at the end who can answer questions. Um, since myself and the other facilitators of the event aren't trained in NBC, but we've um, over, the past over the past year have read the book by Marshall Rosenberg, who is the founder of NBC. Um, did I miss any details? Did that take, does that take place here tomorrow night? Oh, it takes place at Sprout House, which is an intentional community down the road. Um, and uh, if you want the address and whatnot, um, I can give that to you. It's um, 2601 16th Avenue South. Um, and yeah, just in unit one there in our living room. <laughs> so nice and intimate together. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's every third Thursday. We're going to be doing this for the next year and a couple months, reading this book. So if you're not able to go tomorrow, there's more opportunities to check it out. Do you have that posted anywhere? It is posted downstairs on the community board, all the details, including my phone number, where you can text me with questions. Yeah. OK. And my name is Slow. My name is Slow. So. So, and Orrin J. Sofer is, is a wonderful, wonderful Dharma teacher and um, wonderful writer. So thanks everybody for being here this evening and Shelley will be back next week. So take care.